quite a pleasure to introduce to you tonight Cynthia Kempton, who joined our faculty this year as a visitor from Ankara, Turkey. He is a lecturer at the Middle East Technical University in Ankara, now on leave. He also graduated with a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the Middle East Technical University in Ankara. He received there also his Master of Architecture degree, and he then attended the University of Pennsylvania on a Fulbright scholarship where he received a Master of Architecture degree. He currently is working toward his doctorate degree in architecture at Middle East Technical University. He has also taught at the University of Pennsylvania, and he as well has worked in the office of Louis Kahn in Philadelphia. While he worked in the office of Louis Kahn, he worked on the Fort Wayne, Indiana Civic Center, and he had made many trips to Indiana from Philadelphia long before he thought of uh, coming to join the faculty at Ball State. Singes has won awards and been exhibited not only for his architecture, but also for his town planning, for his cinematography, for his woodcuts and etchings and lithographs, and for his sculpture. It is uh, with a great deal of pride that we have uh, uh, a faculty member uh, such as Shengiz Metkin, and it's uh, quite a lot of, with lot, a lot of pride I present him to you tonight. Shengiz Thanks for all of you that you are here tonight. The title is, as you have <coughs> seen before, I'm very excited, is Subtractive Architecture. And uh, I don't know what you have uh, thought when you see a title. Tonight, I will associate subtractive architecture with three meanings. The first one, the one with with a, a meaning of an attitude, an attitude of involvement. A second one would be uh, is a process of forming a space, and the third one uh, will be. meaning associated with learning, with uh, knowing things, subtractive architecture. It's like unlearning in a, in a way, it's like questioning. So subtractive architecture in itself would be uh, referred in, in these three contexts. One is uh, attitude of attitude of non-involvement, non-involvement would be a mind especially. Uh, the other is the uh, actual making of uh, and the third one. Uh, it would be the light here. I'm learning the light here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. With the first meaning, involvement, as well as is 
want all the quality of the environment. Actually, that's the way I, I'm looking at it. And I want all the qualities of architecture too. From there, I would like to go and give, uh, give reference to this definition of architecture that is architecture is a reflection of attitudes and beliefs of people towards life in their physical world. Of course, certain environments do reflect it and certain environments don't reflect it and it reflects I said people's belief but people would mean user, client, designer and builder and people people would mean only client and builder. Thus there is in scale, this difference in reflection and as a result in reflecting in moment, in, in moment, I find vernacular architecture, indigenous architecture of a culture is a direct reflection. Of course, I'm somehow uh, related, well, I'm related with the uh, this area especially. And I can read, I can read words of architecture by just looking at the environment. It won't be maybe as readable uh, to you as, as to me, but I like to generalize this thing that the environment is more readable in the vernacular architecture, indigenous architecture, than here. Mainly because in indigenous architecture, in the vernacular architecture, builder, user, client, and designer are almost the same person, or at least the same person, uh, or a different person but sharing the same beliefs and attitudes towards life. In an industrial, industrialized societies like the ones we have in Ankara and the ones we have over on the world, designers of client and the builder are much separated from the attitudes and beliefs of the, uh, the values of, of the uh, social content, uh, content. Somehow there lies distinction that the vernacular then, vernacular, reflects it in much broader sense, in much broader scale than in an environment uh, that is built by client and the builder. Because client presents singular values. He presents values of, of himself, of his own values, his very personal values. And builder, on the other hand, also presents singular values. It is the architect who takes it and somehow extends it into the social context. That is the, I think, the role of the architect. That's the role of the, of the architect should be. Architect should be, should be thinking in terms of social relations, whatever he is asked to do. So in a way, this was responsibility is also taken away from the architect by, by the builder, I think. I have uh, some failure there too as, as an architect. Generally, reasons are such that uh, there are few reasons uh, for that and the main reason, I think, is, is the reason that technology, well, like technology tolerates us more than it should. I think so. When I look, well, I'll be seeing that too. When I look to 
the brickwork that are done in, in a building and also in a stone building, I see the order of stone and brick, not as tolerant as the order of concrete. Somehow, the full proof quality of concrete makes us architects somehow little insensitive to the material. Maybe we are really underestimating the, the power of, of the material. In any way, technology, I think, I see, is the technology is the quality, the best quality of the technology makes us somehow leave uh, certain things to, to other people and not that much involved with the environment and not design an environment that needs involvement. The other is uh, The design environment, physical as well as mental, they are institutions of higher education, architectural education, that are designed uh, and programmed, uh, directed according to the idea that goes along very well with the builder and client, like architecture in the hands of the builder and the client got into uh, became only a skin that has everything in, in, in it. And schools are programmed to, to have that kind of curriculum. Like in my school, there are numerous courses related to how to build buildings uh, level, but there are none dealing with the boundaries. I mean, boundary determinations, uh, soft boundaries, psychological boundaries. And, of course, the attitude of academia suffers from it. It is becoming more and more uh, important to, to tell people how to run a city rather than really knowing how to run a city. In that context, design media is also affecting architectural expression of the spatial context got to, uh, on, on the paper it's two dimensional now and we somehow forgot that it is that we are really dealing with the with the perceptual environment with the organization of the perceptual environment all the perspective studies or sketch studies that we see in the presentation these days in schools are the ones that are done after finishing the final project it should be just the other way around. We should just be thinking in terms of perceptual environment, then trying to reflect that on plan, on plan, in section, and another media to people. If we are identifying elements on plan, on two dimension, on section, we'll be dealing with shapes rather than perceptual identities. I think that is one of the reasons. And architect being sensitive right. to social values, to environmental values, to, media, to psychological values, to perceptual. He's becoming oversensitive and somehow so sensitive that he's uh, vulnerable. And uh, he doesn't want to deal with people any longer. So just, he gets away. Uh, he likes to criticize more than criticized like everyone. So he's leaving his social responsibility to someone else. Build it. Mm. Today non involvement environment I think is a result of all these forces or maybe even more but I just in vernacular, I'd like to go to the slides now. Um, 
teaches you how you have to cope with it, one way or other, either that way in, uh, in a country like Turkey or here, somehow uh, it teaches you how to get along with it. slides from an uh, area near Ankara. In Central Plateau, I will come to that part later, water is quite scarce. So everywhere you can see that it begins something, it's beginning something. Uh, I was talking about vernacular and reflecting. So, this is town in eastern Turkey. It's an old town. I don't remember the uh, old name uh, for it. It's Mardin. Uh, I don't know the name. It's built on that hill. It's quite high. And from the physical structure, organization, you can see how people are related. You can even read the degree of relationship that they have with one another. Every house has an access to another. A street is speaking to you about your role what you are really expected to do. He is speaking to you about some of his values and interests could have marked. Speaking to you about the role of women and family. Stones and the graveyard and stones. I just want you to see the difference between the ones that we have. Well, this, this is the, the, the kind that you see around Turkey in the village area. And then the other one is the uh, uh, 12th uh, century, 11th century search of graveyard tombstones in uh, one of the far east part of, of the country. Again, uh, this is a, a bad uh, place in southern Turkey, uh, near Urfa, the end of Mesopotamia plain. She sits in front of a house like that. Sorry, I can't focus these. Mardin, again, looking towards Syria, southeastern part of Turkey. It's an old mosque, I don't know how old it is. It's uh, the minaret I 
find it teaches me how to build a minute and how its response, how uh, how how is it strong? I mean, its response to the environment is very rhythmic from from the way it is. The placement of tomb, tombs in Anatolia also speaks of the value. They are incredibly strategically located. You can read these things in the far less good landscape. Very, very I don't really want to go and to give an explanation about each slide. This is just for you to associate whatever said before. These were my students for fourth year architecture in Mentor. We had uh, this Eastern Anatolia trip last September. And I was uh, telling them to capture the spirit of the landscape and the language of the landscape and draw on their paper. And that's what they're doing. A structure like that teaches so much about the structure, about the forces that are acting on the other structure. Uh, by just looking at the pendentives at the corner, the way arch is made, the way dome is made, teaches far more than any book of career education, of any lecture or any classroom, or any school. The mineral, how it was made, is readable uh, from, by looking at that, you can, you can read it. And I think children are the most uh, willing people. They spend so much energy just to get a bit of information. I was taking this slide from, from a car and then they were running. This is uh, one of the caravansarais in central Ramatur. The design of a faucet like that affects the amount of waste. In Ankara, we are really suffering seriously the waste uh, water problem. And somehow, I don't know why, uh, the industry introduced this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, equipment to people there. And uh, it's different than the traditional kind, which you can, in which you can control it much better. This is a study. I, I taught uh, second year architectural design for about four years in, in Turkey. And second year architectural design is the first year when they're introduced to architectural design. First year it goes with the, the base design thing. And in that year they're never, they're not, they don't do any uh, architectural This was their uh, first project. Just make them to uh, somehow sensitive toward the environment, to the elements of the environment, to design factors and processes. So we gave them a box, uh, a cube, 20 feet by 20 feet by 20 feet, and uh, three weeks' time, and asked them to carve the room inside. A room, uh, like a dwelling, is, is a direct expression of man 
these changing and unchanging values. This perception of this spot. So students were doing their own room, sleeping, work, and uh, I think they were accepting visitors, something like that. And they were trying to identify elements to get light, to get air, and to get information, window. I find window is more is a more important element to get information than somehow to get light or to get air. For me, an attitude of closing a window and opening another window or television is very contradictory. So they were fooling around with the, with the openings and spaces. So you see on the right here uh, that the opening there is for air ventilation, but somehow a method of getting rainwater out is also incorporated in the design. We told them to think as if they're inside and trying to get out. And all those dimensions, like 20 feet, 20 feet, 20 feet dimensions, were dimensions to reach to light, to air, and to information view. They weren't supposed to uh, do anything except uh, a carving. I mean, they kind of have tables or doors or anything like that. So they were uh, also working to think about something for a door. So there was this identity that are related with the door. Some have ingenious way of incorporating natural light to act as a doorbell in daytime, of course. Like, they made openings near the entrance so that whenever whoever passes there, the entrance, the room, the light in the room changes and you realize that someone is at the door. And all ways of getting out and getting in and escaping were also uh, in, in the project. Some of them, most of them, have their sleeping areas up that level. And uh, then we, we talk a lot about security, psychological as well as social security. I mean, why and what makes people so keen about a door or key? Or what really makes this 90 degree angle work? Why? The roof is flat. That one has uh, very interesting uh, openings, uh, interesting openings as well as uh, as, uh, as doors and windows and, and uh, air and light. That one was most interesting. So it was a search for need, needs as well as responses to the need. And I find it uh, very helpful to the student of architecture, especially at the second year level. I like to do it myself too. I was I was doing it at that team. Somehow uh, we told them not to draw. Well, it's difficult to draw it anyway. I mean, uh, they weren't really conceiving it, it <laughs> on the on paper. You can't, you can't see it. Nice picture. Architecture, another definition. <laughs> well, it isn't really even definition. It is translation of behavioral inter interrelations into spatial interrelations. And spatial interrelations have not been, uh, should not be limited to um, 
a media of, of some kind. You should be, be really thinking in terms of any kind of interrelation, in terms of various different different interrelations before you translate any kind of behavioral interactions, interrelations into spatial context. Therefore, I find it extremely, extremely helpful to work with a material like that. It gets you away from the conditionings, conditions that are around you. And it makes you work out for new identities, special identities in the environment. That made me think that Hagia Sophia in Istanbul is conceived like that. Like every space interrelates itself with another through this uh, through this boundary, and somehow I like to think that it is conceived as a carved space, carved out space. state of Texas. I think that's uh, a reasonable reference. And 35 million inhabitants and diversity of climate. Mountains on the north Pontic range uh, along the Black Sea coast there and also on the south along the Mediterranean, Mediterranean coast. All plateau rises from west towards east. Pontic Range and Taurus Mountains come together on the eastern part of Turkey. And the western part of Turkey is uh, composed of these broken masses of mountains and the sea is uh, somehow is inside of those mountains. Central Plateau, which is uh, near that lake there, central area, is the place that has uh, a step climb. Kızılırmak, which is that river that bends there, is about 700 miles, something. And Mount Argus, I thought, I, I, I wished I had light in front of my map, so that I can show what I'm doing. And this light here on the right shows you limits of the Anatolian Empire states, the ones that connect Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea Agency, are 150 feet deep, not very deep, and they're all rivers. It's quite mountainous, especially on uh, the eastern side of Turkey. Peaks range from 10,000 to 16,000 feet. This uh, uh, slide from the western part of Turkey, from the Aegean Sea, and uh, these are from southern part of Turkey, that there are these old antique settlements. There. The rivers always have deep valleys, and it's impossible to navigate. That photograph is from Taurus Mountain area in southeastern Turkey. In the central plateau and also on the east, water is always the reference for a settlement.
Central Plateau. From Central Plateau. Very near to Cappadocia region. And uh, people there really know how to cope with the uh, with earth. They know quite a little bit. Cappadocia, I don't exactly know where the name comes from. Uh, two references I have. It's not Turkish. One reference, well, yes, uh, all the references say that it's, it's Persian. If I asked my Persian friends, uh, they couldn't figure out. It's, it means the country of wild horses. And uh, I, I think it dates, dates back to the 5th century BC uh, of the Persian Empire. Central Plateau, it's uh, near the northeastern uh, side of the lake, in the central Anatolia there. The history dates back to third, second millennium to 1100 BC, to the Hittites, then Phrygians, Phoenicians, Persian Empire, Hellenistic period, Byzantium, Roman, Seljuk, and Ottoman Empire. The place is there by the reason of that mountain. It's a volcanic, it was a volcanic mountain once. It's Ergiesta, Mount Argeus, which was here. It's about, I think, 13,000 feet high. And the river of Kızılırmak, the one which bends and makes a large circle there. Yeah. All area consists of volcanic tufa, soft material that you can carve into. And intense erosion made deep valleys in that area. And uh, in some places hard rock erodes in a slower speed so that you have this funny shape uh, rocks uh, you can see in here. And then when they, they're fallen down, they have this conical shape. So uh, I mean, geometric shapes. Well, quite dry climate. Ten inches precipitation, that's the reference I have here. And the, the difference between day and night, the climate difference, heat difference is, is uh, extreme. You can see examples that are carved into cone-shaped places or examples that are attached to like that or carved into it. Uh, of course, you must think that whole valley was once mm, was higher and, and uh, it's a continuous erosion. So if you don't really do a porch in front of your cave, in front of your carved place, you lose whatever you have. I find interesting for these white houses especially, uh, the, the, the joint there. Uh, it's significant because we'll be relating to other joints later uh, when we go. This here you see the central uh, it's a, it's a slide at the center. Uh, that it's starting, uh, the arch is the porch of, of, of or the dwelling in the rock there. And that's that's a beginning for a house. If you don't have anything like that, uh, your uh, place is, is getting, getting... And that would be, then you'll see it in other examples, would be 
the beginning of a prototype. It starts with an arch. Fertile valleys are always left for agriculture, vineyards mainly, and settlements are always at the side of, of, of a hill. cities. I don't exactly know why, what was the reason, but uh, obviously if someone was trying to get away from something, it's, uh, it's quite deep, seven, eight floor deep, people say. I, I've been to only to a part of it. And the gates are like that, it's a round shaped stone. And just go over the other side of uh, the passage and push the stone so that it blocks the entrance, the entryway from one section to another section. And under Grand City has shapes of that sort. That's a, that's a shape that connects to one space to another space. It's not a door, it's really a relationship, the place, the boundary that that bounds these, these two spaces together. I don't know, I'm not certain, but I feel that the first column began, uh, the feeling for the first column was a feeling that was experienced in a cave. I remember when I saw this column, I was very much impressed. And I think people learn, the way they learn from Earth, people learn from the rock dwelling, about structure, about a column, a lot. In Göreme, which is the Turkish name with it, and uh, it means something to do with not being able to see something to do with the sea. I don't. It isn't. It, isn't the, it doesn't have a meaning, uh, a direct meaning in Turkish, but has to do with the way of seeing or not seeing, not being able to see. There are churches, and uh, churches with frescoes conceived as churches 
that are made of brick. Very dark inside, but I personally feel that these shapes were there because of sound and not because that much of the structure. Somehow, you might say, the inside of, in, inside, in inner, inner side of the boundary works for something, then the outer side of the boundary works for something else. For me, this is a way of transmitting sound into that space. These places are very small places. And uh, the places not only uh, the, uh, on the ceiling, but at the side is also carved that there is wonder about, about, about it. Dining rooms are carved with the flat roof. I also, of course, relate flat roof with the sound quality that they want in these spaces. And a table is also carved. It's a very soft material. And even the, uh, the joint of table, it's a continuous piece. The joint of table is, is carved. process is a little, well, it's a irreversible process. You can't reverse it. Once you have a space, and once you carve a space, you can't go back to what it was. But you would change it and make a bigger one, make a different one. This process of irreversibility of course, leaves us with quite less. We can't really trace back what the spatial qualities of all the places were once. They're always changing and changing into a different one because people are going, taking over a place inside and carving their own need into the space, a space which is already carved before. So you might say that the dome here inside is a way of reflecting light. The colors are like that, exactly. Today, there are places that are used by people, still people today, but somehow they're rectangular, the roof like that. I don't know whether they are really trying to see the tolerance of the material or not. And example at the center shows that people really didn't know the capacity of the material at, at that time. You can see numbers of examples like that. Yoreme is uh, now extensively used by Cypriot separate growers in, from the southern part of Turkey. And the spaces inside are uh, with the same moisture all year round, summer and winter. And then we see these people changing from their changing their job into truck drivers because transportation is getting uh, getting better pay. There are eight air uh, that one was a separate storage storage there are eight air vents or special and also special details of that water of the snow out but that, uh, it, uh, but make it ventilated 
Examples of uh, some of the dwellings that are carved into the rock. A prototype uh, starts from the cave. This was the initial residence or dwelling of people. Then they added an arch or a vault in front of it. So it became an arch and I think in reference to what I was saying before, vernacular architecture gives very good definition about architects' responsibility. Architect must be client in the sense of presenting social good and user in the sense of presenting space forming dimensions, mechanical behavior mechanism dimensions. And builder in the sense of actualization of the space, organizing construction. And designer in the sense of evaluator and analyzer and composer. In Göreme, making a house is everybody's business. Everyone in the neighborhood has to say something about it, or at least as free to say something about it. He would advise you to open a window, not on that direction, but on this direction, even if you don't ask him to do so. He just walks in the street, comes near to your house. If you're building something, he would advise you on the material shape of the window. Turkish house characterized with two dominant spatial, uh, two dom dominant spaces. One is rooms, the other is halls. Halls, they are called hayat. Hayat means life, means existence, means living. And Hayat is actually a place of outdoor living. That place over there on top of the entrance you see. It's cooking, eating, drying fruits, grains, carpet weaving, laundry, dishing, dishwash, uh, dishwashing, and sometimes sleeping also in the summer, and accepting visitors. Also a play area for children and area for extending any kind of activity. One side is looking down to the street and the other side looking down looking down to uh, the central court. Hayat has uh, usually two rooms on either side and stairs from Hayat goes to sub Hayat, sub existence, Hayat Altı and then turns toward the entrance, which is underneath of this vault here. Hayat Altı is a stable, a workplace, a milking place, animal care place, and uh, sacking grain, chopping and storing wood, etc. And rooms are for um, living, eating, working, sleeping, bath, also. 
I like to take uh, your attention to that lentil uh, over there, the wood lentil, that differentiates that space from the street. That's the street, and that's uh, the gate, the entrance. If you don't have a, have a wooden thing that, that limits your territory, your property, you have to frame the sky somehow to indicate that that is your territory. Uh, prototype, another one, it's a different one, uh, same in the same, of course, commonness, is, is that one, which starts from the carved out room down there, becomes an arch, and then a room, and then a room on top. Most of the time, services like toilets uh, are hidden underneath the, the, uh, that, uh, that wall there, on either left or to the right side. This was significant, the one at the center. I think uh, it was, uh, uh, there, was they, they, uh, there were two brothers, and they wanted to share after their father's death. <laughs> and that's the thing they could do. It's good that it has two windows. Uh, all these ornaments you see, uh, for me, is a reflection of building's responsibility to the street. It's. It's very important. It isn't really reflecting what is inside. It's doing its job uh, to the environment, to its social environment. It's trying to give, communicate its role, or maybe teaching about shadow, about structure. It isn't any cheaper. It isn't any quicker either. It's just proper. This is what I mean. The carved space inside extends outside with an arch, usually. An arch is hayat, is live, living, is existence. Uh, that type is there is also reflected. It's a continuation of a street in a sense. But it is also a place that you refer to. When you are approaching to a building like that, you come near to the arch. Somehow that is its door. And then you shout, hey, you see, is there is, is anybody there? That is also an extension of street. It's a door, it's a guest room, and maybe even extending some of the activities there, inside activities to the outside. Uh, different color stones uh, they carve there. This is for additive technology, unfortunately. They have very, very ugly buildings in, in that part. When they are adding stone to another stone, they're not really very good. And the central slide shows uh, a pottery furnace. Also related to a place.